Welcome, everyone. I am so excited to be here with Franny Moyle, the author of The King's Painter, and I'm going to ask her to hold up her copy because this is the paperback version but the one you want is the hardback version there are more illustrations and she'll show us some they're integrated right in the text uh, they're but, bigger but, hang on i've got to get this right they're integrated in the book so as you this is the uk hardback not the us hardback the right. uk hardback and um as you read i'm just turning literally at random Almost on every other page, there is an illustration. It really is, you know, the publishers have just done the most magnificent um, job. So the, the, the illustrations present themselves in the right place in the text as, you know, in line with, with um, the story. Well, that's wonderful. So I will have some links where you can get the UK hardback version. So I just want to say straight away, we will all have that. But I want to talk about your history and how you decided on Holbein. You know, he is often, you know, a character. He's certainly well known in Tudor history, but he's not usually the star of the show or the focus of the study. So what drew you to him as your focus for your book? Well, I suppose... Um... My interest, you know, I'm really an art historian. My interest really is the story of British art. And I always feel that the story of British art is always slightly on the back foot from the story of French and Italian art, which always seems to get more uh, coverage. And so as I go through my career, I, you know, pick off another great British painter who I think we just don't know enough about. Now, Holbein, you're going to say, hang on, was he British? Well, a bit. You know, we can come to that in a minute. Well, I'm counting him as British. It, um, uh, and certainly in Britain, if you say Henry VIII and ask someone to imagine Henry VIII, I, I feel quite sure in saying that it will be a depiction by Holbein that springs to mind. Same with Anne of Cleves, same with Thomas More, same with Thomas Cromwell. He was the painter who defined that court visually, not only for his generation, but for all subsequent generations. I mean, those images of those people are indelible in our sort of cultural history. And it struck me um, that Holbein was always rather invisible, the other side of the, you know, the lens. Um, and yet, if you look at his life, um, you know, he was butting up against the greatest figures at uh, an astonishing time in world history. I mean, we're talking, um, it, you know, we're talking uh, 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 about, you know, the great um, break with Catholicism, the rise of Protestantism. We're talking about Erasmus and Luther. And um, of course, we're talking about Henry, uh, in England and Francis I in France and you know and he was up close and personal to all these people so what I realized was that in excavating his story not only was I able to sort of tell through his experience a great swathe of European history because you know he follows the Reformation um, you know, in the rise of Protestantism, his career sort of follows it, um, and then and then he lands in 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 the English court. He he was German, lived in Switzerland half his career, and then the second half of his career in England in London. So you know, he, there is this wonderful story that can be told through his eyes and through the people he paints and it's just a different lens through which to understand um a tranche of history well that's wonderful and you mentioned the different places he lived and actually even within his own family he was a member of quite an artistic 
family. Can you tell us a little bit about his family and where he seems to get his interest, maybe his talent in totally. art? Um, I, I mean, you know, it's so interesting how um, places change in history because uh, Holbein was born in a town called Augsburg. Now, I didn't really know of Augsburg. I, you know, I, I, I was familiar with its name because of a treaty. I looked it up on Wikipedia and it said it's where Messerschmitts had been built. And I'm thinking, OK, but actually, when you dig into Augsburg in, in the 16th century, it was like the Venice of the North or the, the Florence of the North. It was this fantastically important cultural center. And actually, if you're going anywhere, um, you know, if your next holidays go to Augsburg, because it is culturally phenomenal. Not only is the medieval town still completely intact in the center, but the wealth of its museums are jaw dropping. And, you know, this was Maximilian, the Holy Roman Emperor's favorite city. Um, it's where it had the richest bankers in the world. Jakob Fugger was richer than any of the Medicis. Mm. Um, you know, uh, it was a center of, of commerce. And, you know, we all know art follows money, right? And so Maximilian and the Fuggers and the other wealthy patrons were commissioning art. So it was a, an, a town very rich in artists because they knew they could work there and people wanted the best. So the Holbeins had ended up in Augsburg. Um, they had a workshop there. Um, Hans Holbein the Elder was Ho Hans Holbein the Younger's father. <laughs> and he had a workshop with his brother, Holbein's uncle. Um, and their house and that workshop is still there today. It is still extant. I mean, it is so astonishing. Um, and then Holbein and his brother, as, as you did, they just went into the family trade. Um, and so from very early on, it's clear that the boys were both working in, in, in the workshop. But what's also very clear is that Holbein, uh, Hans, rather than his brother, uh, who was called Ambrosius, um, uh, it's very clear that young Hans was a child prodigy. People could spot his talent very, very, very early on. And it, I think it's quite clear that really, as a as a juvenile, he was assisting his father in 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 quite significant ways. There are quite a lot of works by his father where, you, you know, I think the hand of the son is 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 playing an important part. But the workshop went bust. Unfortunately, Hans Holbein the Elder was a very great painter, but not a very great business manager. And it split up under what appeared to be rather acrimonious circumstances and the entire family split. So, you know, the father went off in one direction. Um, his brother Sigmund went off in a, another direction and the boys headed for Basel or Baal, um, which at that time was where the sort of new tech was. It was like heading for California. It's where the printing press was really taking off they thought they would be able to get work as illustrators you know easy work if you like uh, which they did and they established themselves there well okay so they're established there but how does Holbein then if he's got work there how does he get to the English court what sort of brings right. him that route right 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 so in Baal, one of the most important things that happened to Holbein was he got spotted by Erasmus of Rotterdam. Erasmus of Rotterdam, uh, this huge philosopher, um, religious scholar, uh, popular writer, satirist, you, you know, scholar supreme of international renown, friend of princes, um, uh, and not least friend of, uh, of the English court. Um, and Holbein could see that to be a court painter would be a great thing. 
I mean, he could see, he he had a little exploration in 1524. He went and checked out the French court because he quite fancied being Francis the first court painter, but that position was occupied. So that didn't work out. And you can you get a sense that, you know, he, he this was just part of his ambition. Could he get a job as a court painter? Now, alongside that, after 1517 and the, the beginnings of Protestantism, his work was gradually getting harder and harder, i.e. it was, it was um, get, get, slimming down. His commissions were thinning. Um, you, 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 you're probably aware that, you know, the new Protestants uh, didn't look kindly on religious art. They saw... Um, uh, devotional painting as one of the problems with the Catholicism. Um, they saw it as sort of idolatrous in some respects. So, you know, that was problematic. There was a, a they were quite ascetic in their sort of um, views, you know, luxury was frowned upon, painting was a luxury. So even the sort of portrait um, aspect of his work began to dry up. So, you know, there was a good reason why he should seek out a Catholic country where he could be a court painter. Mm -hmm. uh, again, Italy, I think, was overcrowded. There were a lot of smart Italian painters, but no one was there in England. You know, that was a, that was a territory wide open. Um, and at that point, remember, England was Catholic still, completely. Mm -hmm. So here it was a place where he could paint portraits, where he could get religious work, and he might even get a court job, which is security, it's a salary, it's prestige. And so Erasmus, who was had many contacts in London, in England, and with the court, sent him over with letters of introduction to, amongst others, Thomas More, who was then Chancellor, and he turned up in Chelsea, Holbein turned up in, in, in Chelsea, uh, in, you know, where Thomas More lived and was taken in by his household. And really within months of landing there, he had begun to work for Henry's, Henry's court and he was sort of in, if you like. So when we think of Henry VIII, we think of Holbein's representation of Henry VIII. I mean, that is just what comes to mind, I think, in the U.S. as well. So as he as he comes to court and he gets to know Henry and he's doing work for him. Do we know anything about his relationship with Henry VIII? Because we see Holbein at very important times. We see Henry turn to him for propaganda type portraits at very important times they seem to be getting along and that the shift from Henry looking off to the side to Henry looking straight on comes with the whole vine. And so do we know, are they collaborating at all or do they work together? What's their relationship like? Because another thing I find fascinating is Holbein remains in favor in a time where Henry's going through ministers and wives at a pretty good clip. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think in a way, that's your answer. Um, I, I think, you know, we've got to unpick a few things. Henry clearly wanted his, his Leonardo. Mm. You know, Francis I had Leonardo, who supposedly died in his arms. And the prestige that Leonardo could, could give to Francis was considerable. Um, Charles Matician, you know, Henry had no one. He really needed someone. And Holbein was spotted by the court as someone of comparable genius to Leonardo. And there was poetry, court poetry written about Holbein. Henry uh, gives him the title, the King's Painter. He gives him a salary. He gives him gifts as part of his New Year's gift giving, which he does to his household. So, you know, he is embraced, if you like, he is part of Henry's household. And Henry does describe him uh, in some of the documents as my dear Holbein. You know, he does actually ascribe some, um, uh, you know, some 
some affectionate terms um, to the painter. So he was admired. He had the king's ear, I think, probably, which was one of the most astonishing privileges that anyone could have had. You know, he could get close to the king because he had to. Mm -hmm. So he would have been able to have a degree of conversation with the king, which was exceptional. And because Henry was a um, extremely um, cultured man, you know, I suspect Henry enjoyed talking to Holbein, who of course was a very brilliant person, not just as a technical painter, but you know, his, the conceits in his work are evidence of the quality of his mind. Mm-hmm. However, when you talk about propaganda, I think you can't separate Holbein from his relationship with Cromwell, which was incredibly close. And the extent to which the portraits of Henry were encouraged, determined, and even plotted by Cromwell is not clear. But I, I, I think the ev- you know, the uh, circumstantial evidence is that Cromwell's hand is all over them, actually. So I think it was a triumvirate. I think it was Holbein, Henry, and Cromwell. You know the the magicians making the propaganda and of course Cromwell embarked on some propaganda with Holbein that was a bit too rich even for Henry in its Protestantism because although Henry had split from Rome he was always really a good Catholic his split from Rome was pragmatic it was not um, because of any Lutheran sympathies or Protestant sympathies Um, You know, his reform of the church was actually, again, pragmatic to fund the royal coffers. Um, uh, And this was all useful to Cromwell, who was, in contrast, someone who was uh, uh, committed to religious reform from a point of view of a change in, you know, system of belief. And Holbein, with Cromwell, certainly... Um, made some works that were used, you, you know, in, after the Anne of Cleves, of course, the Anne of Cleves portrait brought all this to a head because Henry didn't like Anne of Cleves. He blamed Cromwell for making a disastrous marriage. But of course, he couldn't really destroy Cromwell for that reason. He had to get him for another reason. So he was. He was actually, um, you know, condemned on heresy. You you know, Mm -hmm. it was because of his Protestantism and some of the materials he was producing with Holbein that that, that was what was cited, if you like, um, in his execution. Now, what's so interesting there is that Holbein survived. Holbein didn't get dragged down and a lot of Cromwell's supporters were running out of the country as fast as they could. And Holbein, as far as we know, didn't. He stayed put. Mm -hmm. And certainly in 1541 seems to be working again. It goes a bit quiet, second half of 1540, as one could tell. You know, maybe he was in prison. I looked through all the records I could find to see if he'd been arrested, couldn't find any records, but someone might come across that. It could be that he was arrested. It could be that he was put under a kind of house arrest. Who knows? But he survived Mm -hmm. and he continued taking a salary and he began to work again slowly but surely. It it is true that there is a fall off in work, which suggests that people didn't want to go too near him until they, you know, till he ceased being toxic. But he survived and royal commissions did come back and he was clearly not blamed. So, you know, I think that says quite a lot about the relationship between Henry and Holbein as well. That is interesting. And that's such an interesting time because he does come back and he is back as the court painter and the king's painter. And um, so he does somehow survive that. And that's a really telling time. Now, you mentioned Mm -hmm. some of the propaganda and some of what he embeds in his paintings. And one of my favorites because it fascinates me and I know you really enjoy talking about it is the ambassadors that is 
just a wonderful painting. So in addition to painting the king in all these ways that we remember him and painting the wives, he does some other commissions. And so could you talk to us about the ambassadors? Because that's such a fabulous and fascinating painting. I I mean, he did lots of commissions for other courtiers and other, you know, visiting dignitaries and so on and so forth. So he wasn't just exclusively um, painting the king. Um, uh, And in fact, you know, he was clearly, I mean, he did a portrait of Cromwell before he did a portrait of the king. He did probably a portrait of Anne Boleyn now last, you know, and so on and so forth. So he was widely um, uh, patronized outside of, you know, the immediate uh, court around Henry as well. Um, The ambassadors, of course, is is so fascinating um, because it presents so many mysteries. I mean, I um, have a a view of of what it's trying to do. And, you know, I could talk forever about it, but I'll try and sort of pray see. Um, It's, I found it here. Um, Perfect. It it is um, a portrait made in uh, 1533, the year in which Anne Boleyn is crowned queen. Mm-hmm. And it features two French ambassadors, uh, Jean de Dantville, who is, uh, no, hang on, I get upside down, is it? <laughs> Jean de Dantville. And this is the Bishop uh, of Selve. And um, one, one wonders why they might be painted together in 1533. One also wonders why they might might be painted together. And again, I think, you know, this is one of the first questions one should ask. Why are these two unrelated men mm-hmm. together in a portrait? Now, normally this kind of portrait would be a family portrait, man and wife, man and son. Very rarely two mates or two associates. So I think one has to ask why, what associates them? And what associates them is that they were both involved in the sort of negotiations around um, the announcement of uh, Henry's marriage to Anne Boleyn and her subsequent coronation on the world stage. Henry wanted France's approval to sort of soften the blow. He wanted the Pope's approval. At this point, he was still a good Catholic king. The Pope didn't like the idea obviously of of Catherine of Aragon being divorced and uh, and um, uh, the king marrying again so there was a big sort of a huge swathe of international diplomacy going on um, prior to Anne's coronation which was essentially being brokered by the French and it was essentially being brokered by de Dantville in London um, and de Selve was a special emissary who came over um, during those negotiations. And it seems likely that this portrait, therefore, commemorates that moment when they've reached some sort of accord that, you know, with France, with Henry, with Anne, with everyone, everyone's, you know, they've managed to come up with whatever it was they needed to come up to get Francis to say, thumbs up, we'll support the that, I mean, you know, Henry was already secretly married, but, you know, the public marriage, mm-hmm. if you like, the coronation, will support it. And in fact, Dampville um, led the cor- uh, coronation with, you know, 12 uh, French noblemen, you, you know, uh, and processed, you know, through through Greenwich and London in the day before her coronation. And, and de Dampville and his French um, noblemen led that um uh, procession. So, you know, the importance of de Dampville and the French in, I suppose, what Henry and perhaps Anne saw as a, almost like um, an Anglo-French alliance because of Anne's association with the French court was very important as part of the pageantry. <laughs> so the fact there are these two men here in this portrait in 1533 and that they were both uh 
in London specifically on this business suggests it in some way might commemorate the moment. And if one begins to look at some of the objects that Holbein places between these men, there's this sort of two-tiered buffet. And on the top tier, there are sort of astrological um, uh, items, tools, if you like, to measure sort of time um, and, uh, and so on and so forth. And then on the bottom shelf, there's a globe and musical instruments. And my view is that you have to see them all as co coordinates and everything is working in this painting, in, in my view, to sort of put these two men and their diplomacy in perspective. So if you take the astronomical um, tools and you look at the days and dates and times they're pointing to, they actually point to the date of Anne's coronation. Mm. So again, that suggests this is something to do with that. The two men are standing in a marriage format and they're standing actually on uh, a paving stones, which are, um, these paving stones are uh, a copy of the Kismati pavement in Westminster Abbey. And that's where Anne stood when she was crowned. So again, that seems to all be suggesting that this is commemorating a moment in time when these two men did something in connection with that uh, coronation. And then at the bottom um, shelf, this is more taking a sort of cultural temperature of, of the time um, where you see how the world, the globe shows how the world was divided at that moment between you know, the Americas were divided between, you know, Spain and so on and so forth. And, um, it, you know, it shows key cities. The lute, um, actually, with a broken string, it's a lute with a broken string. At that time, that was an emblem of diplomacy mm -hmm. because, you know, the idea is that if you've got six strings uh, that are perfectly taught, you can make good music, but it only takes one to break and you're back to the beginning. So it's the idea of... Um, it shows how hard uh, harmony is to achieve, but it's the job of the diplomats to achieve that. Lute can also, if you say it out loud, of course, sounds like Luther. Um, and we know that de Selve was seeking, um, you know, wanted to find a way that the uh, uh, traditional Roman Catholic Church and the new church could work together. So he is trying to find a harmonic relationship between, if you like, the warring um, uh, uh, Christian factions at the time, um, and and you know, and and so on and so forth. I mean, I can go on and on, but I, but I, you know, in summary, what I think it, it does as a painting, you have to see it as a map, which is trying to pinpoint these two men and their very specific diplomatic roles. Um, at the time of this marriage um, and the issues they were dealing with. I think that is so fascinating. And when you imagine Holbein as author, illustrator, thinker, I mean, he's doing all of these things to create this masterpiece that you can read and appreciate on so many levels. And I think I just really love that in the way you speak about that, because it reminds us that in addition to these wonderful, beautiful portraits that bring these people to life, there are stories he's telling in his Absolutely. paintings. And the Absolutely. more the more attention we pay, the more we get. So I, I really yeah. appreciate that. So thank you for taking us through that. Now, in your research about Holbein, was there anything that just sort of surprised you or took you aback that you hadn't expected to find? Oh, uh, well, that's a tricky question. Um, I suppose, I suppose what really uh, hit me was how close he was to seismic events and the people 
related to them. You, mm. you know, a man who could have, you know, a man who knew Erasmus, who sketched Erasmus, who drew the king, who had been at Francis's court, who had met Cromwell, who'd met Moore. I mean, that very exposure, of course I knew it was there. But his level of engagement, I think, with certainly when you when you look at the work he was doing in Basel, pictures like the Dead Christ and so on and so forth, the extent to which he is talking to the very sort of complex and profound theories of people like Erasmus, mm. it really sort of hit me. You know, this is a, an artist who is right in the thick of it and he's not although it's very hard to really ever pinpoint Holbein's opinion because he's always working on a commission for somebody. So, you know, to get to the real Holbein is always a bit smoke and mirrors. Nevertheless, he is engaging very profoundly with these, with these moments in time and these um, thoughts and political points of views and movements that have consequences that we all still feel today. And he was there on day one. And I find that astonishing, actually. It sort of spooks me out. That's right. And all of the people he knew around the world, you know, and how much the right. world changed from his childhood throughout his life. Totally. How much the world changed. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And he was at the center of all that change. So totally. that that is really extraordinary, an extraordinary way to think of him. So as you look at him, and of course you share other, other stories as well in this wonderful book, but as you look at him, what are some of the most important legacies you think Holbein has left us um, from that time where so much changed? What do we understand better or are more able to see and appreciate because of his work? Just a few things that you feel like yeah. continue to enrich us today. Well, I think if one takes real time to immerse yourself in, in the, the kind of literature that, you know, his painting is reflecting back. I, I, I mean, if you, you, you can't, then you understand that, that his art, his religious painting, in his religious painting, which is, was made in the first half of his career, there is bound up all the debate about Catholicism, mm. all the debate about um, uh, Reformation and where the church is going, all sorts of astonishing interactions with devotional work that I suspect we have lost as a culture, a sort of potency, a magic in, in that work, you know, for, for pre-Reformation Catholics, um, where he invites people into imaginary spaces, if you like, where the veil is very thin, where you pass through into an imaginary space and quite literally commune through an image with other worlds. I mean, you know, I think really stuff like that is going on. And, you know, again, it's hard to talk about that in a kind of shorthand, you know, because I found myself looking at these paintings and then going and reading, you know, of course, Erasmus, this, that and the other, mm -hmm. and suddenly understanding how profoundly different um, the importance of religious presence was in the world then than it mm -hmm. is today. That's one thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the other thing that is so stunning uh, about Holbein is, you know, we're all saying if only we had photographs of the past. Well, Holbein is one of the few artists who really does give you practically a photograph of the past because in the history of art, he is almost unparalleled in his ability to capture a likeness of someone. He, he has this astonishing, particularly if you look at the drawings, I think he's even better 
in his mm. drawings than he, than he is in paint, actually. Um, it's as if his sitters are breathing in front of you on the paper. They are so real. They could blink at any moment. And I get that with very, very, very few artists. But you get that with Holbein. Mm. And so what his paintings tell us about those people is as good as it's ever going to get. You know, no mm. photograph could give us more. We're getting as close to history um, than, you know, the next thing would be a time machine. And, and I think very few people deliver that. Very few people have been able to deliver that in the story of the world. And Holbein can deliver that. He can get you up close to Henry and you can look at that pudgy face and those little mean eyes and you can sort of smell the king. And, you know, the, the, the same, you know, it just takes some time, again, communing with these, these works and you are transported. Um, and very few artists deliver that. Well, I, I appreciate that. And a question I often get is why do we continue to be so interested in the tutors? And I think one of the reasons is we feel like we know them because of what Holbein gives us yeah, of them. I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And they feel so modern. Those faces are, of course, because. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why wouldn't, they, why wouldn't they be? Right. They just feel like they're right there with us because of his extraordinary talent in bringing them to life and yeah. all of the other things he did. And he did a number of things in addition to portraiture, but those portraits um, really do bring us right into that world in amazing ways. So um, yeah, it's, it's just quite extraordinary. Thank you. Now I want to ask also what you are working on now. What can we look forward to coming oh, wow. up? Oh, wow. So, yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I've jumped into a different time frame. I'm back in the 18th century now. Um, I'm working on, you see, I say I write about British art and then uh, contradict myself, but I'm, I'm writing about two incredibly famous 18th century painters uh, who were very, very famous in their day, but I suspect less so now. One was called uh, Elizabeth Louise Vigée Le Pin, and she was Marie Antoinette's court painter, and she is one of the most brilliant neoclassical painters. And her direct contemporary was uh, a woman called Angelica Kaufman. Um, again, in her day, the best-selling artist in print in Britain, found a member of the Royal Academy, uh, someone who was admired by everyone from Wilk Winkleman to Goethe to, you know, two huge figures. And they met one another in Rome in 1789 um, and because of their mutual admiration for one another. So I'm writing about that meeting and using that meeting as a lens to look at their careers, respective careers and their importance in the history of art because they've been a little bit overlooked to say oh. the least. That sounds wonderful. Well, thank you for teasing. They are amazing women. Amazing women. Oh, that sounds Absolutely great. Amazing. And it, it makes me quite cross that uh, they're not given more um, attention. Vigée Lebrun is given more attention in France than Kaufman is in Britain because Kaufman worked extensively in, in Britain. Um, but even so, both of them... Uh, could be given more. <laughs> well, that's a great invitation for us to pay more attention. So that's wonderful. Well, we will look forward to that. Now, are you on social media? Are there places we can follow you? Website? I'm on Twitter, now known as X. Okay. Um, I, I do have a website, perennial.com, probably should update it, but you can always buy books from me there. Okay. Um, and that means I will sign them and wrap them beautifully and put a little postcard and send them off to the States. No problemo. So okay. you can get the whole bunch of hardback there if you wanted. Um, and any of the other books, you know, Mrs. Oscar Wilde, J.M.W. Turner, pre -rats. Yes. So there are, there are other books as well, and I will have those. And just a reminder for this book, The King's Painter, 
the version you want is the UK hardback, which we can buy from you as well as from some other UK publishers, but you can buy them right from her. I can, you know, sign it and dedicate it. Should you say wish. Christmas. (laughs) And yes, that's, well, that's my Christmas started. So I'll just let that information go right to my husband right after I finish. So yeah, thank you so much for spending this time with us and taking us into the world of someone we hear of a lot. If you're, you know, familiar with Tudor history, you've heard about Holbein, but to get the fuller picture of how important he was and how, as you said, he was right in that front row seat, not just in Henry's court, but in Europe during the whole religious um, experience that was evolving and changing every moment ground literally moving and he's right there so thank you he's right there but and he is one of the greatest painters of all time as well you know what a bonus what a bonus (laughs) and so the paintings can tell so many stories and bring us right into the room with those people so totally just wonderful thank you so much it's really helped uh, me understand and appreciate him even more So thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I'm so happy to have taken that that you have taken us into the world of Hans Holbein and um, seeing the Tudor court on the other side of the lens, as you say. So thank you so much. Thank you for listening. And we'll have more ahead as we keep shaking up history together. (music) 